Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Thomas Church, Fifth Avenue, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm so glad you're here today. I'm here for the second class that I'll be teaching of three on the rare, um, on the, hello, good to see you, Betsy, on the ornamental facade of St. Thomas Church. Um, we had a uh, technical, I had been technical difficulties last time. The, um, the, some of the content that I had intended to teach last week is now available on our YouTube page, on our St. Thomas Church YouTube page in the classes section. You'll be able to find all the classes that we've been recording over the past many months uh, on that YouTube page. That's where it goes. Some people, times people are like, where is it available? It's usually available these days, one or two days after uh, the class is taught. Uh, if not, uh, if you give us a moment, I'm certain it'll be up, you know, not too long after that. Uh, it's an extraordinary resource that we're building, you know, resource of, uh, you know, cultural heritage and learning. So um, we're really excited about it. And uh, this will be another iteration of it today. Again, second class of the ornamental facade. I'm so glad we're here. Um, I have, and I want to just test um, this system. I want to jump right into the photos because you don't need to see me for much of this. I want to get thumbs up from everyone that you can see this image. Or, or just a word verbally from those at home. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Yes. Okay, great. Wonderful. Now I'm going to manipulate here, see if that works. Perfect. Now, to review a little bit of what I said last time, you know, the church built in the teens, uh, late teens, was not um, finished in terms of its ornamental facade. But there was a plan for it to be finished. And that plan is um, found in a document that I want to show you now. I'm going to go through these uh, um, images. I'm giving you a preview here. Um, this one. Here we go. All right, now, it's an extraordinarily large file, about 64 megabytes. They had a really deep scan of it in our digital archives. And it's certainly in our archives. And you can look up here. This is the West Elevation. And you can see St. Thomas Church, New York City, New York, Cram, Goodhue, and Ferguson Architects, New York and Boston. Now, the number seven is because this is the seventh page of several elevations that are featured in um, the plans. And look, it's, we've got our lovely um, seal there done. And I love how they've created little dots for the cross and the book and the, and the square. You know, just to create, you know, some um, ruggedness. You know, I, I appreciate that. So it's also interesting in St. Thomas. Oh, you're right. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Now, now I go to a church. I, my first church that I was the curate of in my career was called Christ's Church, uh, Rye, and it still is. They still keep the apostrophe s. It's an archaicism now, but we still use it. Uh, is it archaic if it's still happening? Mm, I don't know, <laughs> but most churches don't. So yes, yeah, St. Thomas's church. I and when we have British preachers, they often will refer to this as St. Thomas's. Really? Got it. So the British... Uh, not archaic. Really. It's not archaic there. <laughs> right. And um, so one of the things that we were focusing on last time was the lower part of the elevation. Um, down here, let's look closely. And they have a very interesting method. Let's say, look at the arches, which I want to look at this morning. Um, bosses and ornament in main arch. Can you see that? Blocked for carving. Do you see that text? So that means that they were out, that they made the arches, and they gave enough uh, bulk of stone on the arches, but they didn't carve them until the 1960s, until 62 to 63, when they did the George C. Scott Memorial. And those images were up for grabs, it seems. It seems that one could, you know, swoop in and, and change the plan a little bit. Because, look at this. Look very closely at the ornamentation around the rose window. Let's look carefully. All right. Here. My goodness, that's lovely. Can you see this? Yes, very clear. It's excellent. All right. So now um, if you were look, I'm going to show you the actual pictures of what we have very soon. So, so bear this in mind. This is not a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, there's text above that's, oh, let me let this person in. There's text above that says, let us also go. 
that we may die with him. That's those are the, one of the words, one of the phrases that we have from St. Thomas in uh, the Gospels, where he commits to going to Jerusalem with Jesus. Uh, a great contrast to St. Peter on the tra- Mount of Transfiguration. He says, no, 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 Lord, let's stay here. Let's stay on the Mount of Transfiguration and set up three booths. St. Thomas says, let us go that we may die with him. An extraordinary statement. And then there's two angels that are holding the crown of Christ, uh, the heavenly crown of Christ. All right, see that they're, they're and look, it says blocked <laughs> for carving. That means they had not been carved initially. And we're going to be carved later. Um, but let's look at the what, what, where the real differences come up. Um, what do you see of the, in, the, in the kind of, um, there's the rose window here. Uh, bosses blocked for carving, it says as well. But on the left, it shows an angel in a roundel with a scroll. And it says St. Matthew. Let's look a little bit closely. And this lovely pen and ink, all of this is in pen and ink. Um, and he's got a scroll. Now, this is a very traditional way to render one of the Gospels, one of the evangels. And over here, you'll see another traditional way to render an evangelist, St. Mark. Um, the, uh, if, if everyone could mute, please. I'm going to mute you if you're, you're not muted. Um, St. Mark, a flying lion. St. Mark, we see that in Venice all over the place, holding a book, holding the Gospel. And then down here, the plan was for there to be a St. John with a scroll, um, an eagle, which is the sigil of St. John. And then over here, you would have had, oh, oh, I'm, oh I'm spoiling it. Oh, okay, let's go back. Um, over here, you have a flying ox. It, it's gonna come into, into shape very soon. It's going to say, um, there it is, spandrels blocked for carving. That's the word I was looking for, spandrels. Uh, the kind of the negative space in the square where the rose window sits are the spandrels. Inside the spandrels was intended for there to be carved uh, St. Luke in this one. So the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I remind you that these creatures, a flying person, a flying ox, a flying lion and a flying eagle, eagle are all um, show up in visions of Ezekiel in, uh, um, flying around the throne of heaven. It also shows up in the imagery of St. John the Divine um, in heaven, around the throne, um, with the Lamb, all kinds of extraordinary creatures. And scholars think, and this is something I think is very interesting, that these were the uh, sigils for a variety of tribes or the or quarterly divisions of the camp in in the camp that um, the Israelites were taking through the wilderness. You know, they'd always have to set up shop. They'd always have to make a camp. They would always have to set up a tabernacle, a tent tabernacle. Some people think that these are the you know the flags that they flew to keep a sense of who's where. You know, like a Disney World, you got the Pluto parking lot. You've got the Mickey Mouse parking lot. You know, it's huge amounts of space that you have to maintain. Or like Burning Man, you have to decide who is you know, sitting where. Um, that's what some people think the derivation of this might be. But be that as it may, so let's look carefully at what was ultimately decided 50 years later by the team of Canon West, we talked about last week, who's at the cathedral, the sub of the cathedral, well-known for his heraldry and ecclesiastical symbolism. And he designed the symbolism of the, um, the seal of the Anglican communion. Um, he did all kinds of things. He was pulled in uh, by the rector at the time to uh, support this work. He had a hand in taking this, uh, you know, pen and ink drawing and plan. And what did he do? I want to show you, if you don't already know. Um, this. All right, can you see this, everybody? Mm-hmm. Now, um, they changed the text. Do you see what they did? Look at the text. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thou art the king of glory, O Christ. Not the text that was found in the plan. So it looks like, uh, Father Turner, do you know where this comes from? 
Thou art the king of glory, O Christ. The Te Deum, right. So, Father Turner, look at this. I found the elevation from the teens. Yes. And Canon West changed the text. Oh, look at that. The text was intended to be, let us also go that we may die with him. The, well, the quote of St. Thomas. And in, in the 50 years later, Canon West, uh, you know, came in and was giving free reign, it seems, over the uh, symbolism. And instead of choosing a, a quote of our saint, of our patron, he chose the Te Deum, an expression of Catholic spirituality. It was very appropriate for here, but it was something else. Um, what he maintained was the um, crown. Let's look closely at how they portrayed them here. Look at these. Whoa. Now, it was vague in the pen and ink drawing. You know, so make, an, make two angels holding a crown. And this is how it was created in 1962. You know, um, the angels have two wings. They have robes. They're holding a crown. The crown has a cross on it. And um, it's very beautiful and just like what the plan planned. Um, there's a, we're going to look carefully maybe next week about the root at the root screen, um, which is with the root group, which is at the top of, um, the ornamental facade. Here, let me, um, let me show you, let's see, get this out of the way. No, go I'll get you out of the way. Put you over here. All right. Now, up here is the rude group that was blocked for carving at the time. Um, it's, again, a pen and ink drawing um, that was going to be uh, clarified. Uh, there you go. Now, a crucified Christ with his mother Mary and the beloved disciple on either side. Um, and then in a straight line down, you would have the cross of Christ underneath him. Um, but we'll look at that later. I didn't want to focus on that. What I did want to focus on with you all is this archway. All right. Now, this archway, you could have put anything in this archway based upon the plans. It says bosses and ornament in main arch blocked for carving. And so what would um, the team um, who was engaged decide to put in that archway? All right. Let's look carefully. All right. So can you see this, everybody? All right. So what it seems is they chose three. I'm going to get to that. Here it is. All right. There's three racks. There's an outer row, a middle row, and the inner row, the inner arch. Um, we can bring it in just a little bit more. Um, I'm going to hide this. Let me see if I can hide this. Hide thumbnail video. There we go. All right. Now, I'm not going to look at all of them from this perspective, but I do want to point out that out of all the three arches, at the summit of them all is, aha, oh, the Holy Spirit. You have there the Holy Spirit, a dove with a halo on her. And, you know, just like the dove of the Holy Spirit over Christ at the at baptism, um, or, the, you know, Holy Spirit descending like a dove. And then all kinds of other ranks. The, the first, the outer row is the is, are the symbols of the gifts of grace, which the Holy Spirit bestows at confirmation. The next row, the middle row, are symbolized various branches of learning. Look very closely at those. And then the inner arch you know, depicted various vocations. The vocations are a big deal. Um, and I was reading about the um, Central Park, and you know they have vocations at every gate of the park, engineer's gate, scholar's gate, you know, all that. You know, and that was a big, uh, why they did that is because it was made right at, around the Civil War and they were trying to proclaim that paid labor is the basis of a nation, not unpaid slave labor. Uh, you know, vocation, paid work was a big deal. And I think um, maybe this is a, this is not done in the sight of uh, you know in the shadow of the Civil War. It is done in the shadow of the Civil Rights era. But uh, vocation, um, trying to bind together the vocation of the church with the vocation of all the people are doing um, outside of the church. Um, so learning and vocation. It's almost like you're schooling and your life after school. You actually do what you were you're trained to do, and then the gifts of grace of the Holy Spirit. 
Let's look closely at all of these beautiful uh, carvings. Um, let me try to start here. All right, let's start with the outer. No, let's start with the inner, inner band here. All right, now, what is interesting is um, along, uh, among all of them is inner, they alternate. So for example, here is um, a kind of, these are all like cylinders. They're like cylindrical, oh, move that out of the way. Why did you, all right, there we go. These are all like cylinders going through a pneumatic tube. <laughs> and uh, on each cylinder is one of the, um, uh, is one of the symbols. Now we can see here, uh, nothing in particular, it's just a bunch of oak leaves and acorns. Um, over here we have the beginning of the middle branch, uh, the middle row, uh, is, this is medicine. Do you see the acephalous uh, seal um, symbol? And it looks like prescription, you see RX there? And uh, it looks like what looks like a, um, is that a syringe? Yeah, looks like a syringe to me and a, a, and a kind of a beaker. And doctor's bag. Oh, a doctor's bag. Yeah, isn't that great? All right, so, but I didn't want to start on that middle row. But I also wanted to point out that over here are grapes and a vine. Classic. All right, so now the grapes is obvious in terms of the classic Christian imagery. It was also grapes in gold and vines in gold around the gates of the temple, uh, the Holy of Holies. Well, before you got into the inner sanctum of the temple, there were all these beautiful gilded um, um, fruit of the grapes and the vine. Um, but of, of course, this is uh, wine, you know, wine imagery. Um, you go further up and you see roses, and roses are a big in Christianity. They symbolize, you know, um, five petal roses. They symbolize the wounds of Christ. Red roses are like the crucifixion. White roses are like the resurrection. And the oak, you know, this is, you know, Abraham was seen as a, an oak. And so when you say Abraham and his seed forever, you should be thinking of acorns, you know? And, you know, and when everyone says seed, you know, it's not, you're not just thinking of little tiny seeds, but acorns. And, you know, acorns and secular imagery, sorry, not secular, pagan imagery was divine as well. These great trees and these long lasting hundred year, you know, these trees that could last for a long time were, you know, were connected to the divine. Um, and let's see what other kind of foliage do we get? We get, oh, what, what do we see here? Wheat, great, right, you know, matching with the grapes. Now, again, the wheat and the grapes are before we come into the picture, all right? Before you can get bread and before you can get wine of the sacrament, you have to have human artifice come onto the scene, all right? Uh, you know, it's very interesting that we, you know, we don't say, uh, we don't offer up to God wheat and grapes and then make it into wine, and, and bread at the altar. We take the bread that's already made, the wine that's already made, something that we had to take, uh, we had to structure the works of creation into a new way or a fresh way and make it into something um, augmented by our care and, um, and knowledge, our vocation and our learning. And, uh, and then we use it for worship. Then at the summit of the archway in the center. Can you tell what flowers those are? Lily. Yep, the white lily, the Easter lily. So right adjacent to, in the center, with uh, the Lord of the Holy Spirit, God, is uh, the white lily, the resurrection. Um, you know, it's believed the white lilies were, appeared where the drops of blood fell from Christ's body after the crucifixion. There's a legend there. But it's mainly, you know, some people think it's like it rises from a single bowl, which represents kind of like Christ rising from a tomb. But these are also images of purity. But I never thought about this idea of coming, of something bursting forth from that bowl, like Christ bursting forth from the tomb. Isn't that beautiful? I've always seen the lilies, but I've never thought of the dynamism of the symbolism until just when I started thinking about it last night, you know, looking, reflecting on these. So there are lilies at the summit of the middle, um, middle arch. Let's go down and just carefully make our way through um, the outer band. 
reminding you that these plants, the oak, the grapes, the vine, the wheat, the roses, the lilies, which only show up once, will be all throughout here. All right, let's start. So here we have the oak, and then we go to what looks like, what does this look like to you? Here. It's an ear. It's an ear, and it looks like um, uh, the Ten Commandments. It looks like incense and angels above the Ark of the Covenant. You see that? You see those two two angels here? That's the classic image of the two angels tuck, with their wings touching. That's inside the Holy of Holies. So you've got law and the, the, the Ten Commandments. You've got the, the um, throne of mercy in the Holy of Holies. But then you have an ear. <laughs> and then you have here a censer. Uh, some kind of lamp that's bringing out incense, right? Now, I need to go up just a little bit more to make sure I'm right and orient myself. Aha, great. Now I know where I am. So this looks like someone having their hands laid on them at, at confirmation. Um, it looks like um, o C, I don't I think that's the holy oil. Um, and there's a stole. All right. Now I'm gonna make sure I get this right, but I believe that this here is wisdom and understanding. All right. So the ear, you could say, let them with ears to hear hear, that Jesus is saying. Um, and you know, wisdom is found through the law, it's found in worship. And it's found in holiness and the beauty of holiness in, in, with incense. You go up here and you'll see counsel. And, and, and the title is counsel and ghostly strength. So, um, you, know, you know, the laying on of the hands is meant to be a fortifying act. You know, a confirmation is meant to fortify you in the decisions you have made. And uh, this is titled ghostly strength, uh, meaning like the Holy Ghost is going to support you. And then you make your way past the wheat to the Holy Spirit here. All right. And now since this is so big that I need to loop back around and uh, come to the other side. Uh, let's see. One, two, uh, three. There we go. All right. Let's come back over here. We'll see here. Um, Knowledge and true godliness. Now, it's hard for me to tell what this says, <laughs> but again, there's another um, a sensor, some kind of lamp that has incense coming out of it, and then a, a hand on a book, some kind of learning, which is difficult to see from here. I see the words et, et, so it's something like, maybe it says scope, oh, I don't know. I don't know what it says, but I'm going to find out. Um, and that is knowledge and true godliness, and then you work your way down past the grapes to holy fear. Right, now, holy fear is a fascinating image. Uh, the angels in the book of Isaiah, in the vision of Isaiah, the, the six-winged seraphs have uh, hide their face before the presence of, the, of God. It seems that just like humans, uh, angels can be destroyed too by looking upon God face to face. So look, he's hiding his face with his wings right there. Um, he's got um, wings to fly, but also wings to cover his shame um, or, or himself, and then wings to cover his feet as well, another you know, indecent part of the body. And what is he wearing? He's wearing a dalmatic or um, with apparelled amices, with these amices which have, you know, uh, cloth on them that makes them stick up, and they usually match the vestments really beautifully. Uh, this is Canon West all the way. I mean, Canon West was a high churchman uh, in terms, you know, Anglo-Catholic uh, sensibilities. They never really got the cathedral into that mode uh, fully in the way that you might witness it here. But Canon West was trying to pull them into the 19th century, you know, <laughs> kicking and screaming. So, holy fear. All right, and so what is very interesting is that the angels in heaven, they sing holy, holy, holy. 
So to call this holy fear is kind of a pun as well. To, you know, the seraphs sing holy, holy, holy. They're afraid, you know, they, they have a good judgment in hiding their face in themselves because they want to do the right thing and not, you know, be destroyed. And, um, and this is a grace that's evidently bestowed upon us at confirmation. We like the, the angels are uh, careful. We too should be careful like the angels. Um, all right, let's start on the middle arch and let me make sure this is the various branches of learning. Which branch of learning do you think this one is? Justice. Yep, law. The law. And it looks like there's some obelisk next to Lady Justice, who's um, you know blind. Her scales are behind her. Do you see the scales that are there? Um, let's see where my um, my mouse is going. See, this is the scale, and it's tipped one way. And and this is kind of one of the you know containers of of weights. It's kind of being flung up. It's almost like it's it's just fallen down. And this part has just been flung up and is still kind of swinging around because the moment of justice has just occurred. <laughs> the moment of revelation of which is weighted proper, which weight is going down, which weight is going up, a classic symbol of justice. I imagine the obelisk is an allusion to some law code that's on an obelisk somewhere in the, you know, from that we found from the ancient world. I don't know if Cleopatra's needle has any law on it. Does anybody know? Yeah, well, I, or Hammurabi's code was found on a obelisk. I'm not certain, but it is an allusion to the ancient quality of the law. And then what looks like a bunch of law books. See that? You move along past the roses that I talked about, and you make your way to, what do you think that is? Archery, military. Well, close. Well, actually, not at all. Philosophy. So philosophy is demonstrated by an arrow hitting the target right at the mark, all right? So you're trying to use your language precisely to say what is true in the love of wisdom. And it looks like there is our, our books there too, but what looks like, what does that look like to you, that broken, it looks, it looks to me like a broken plow I'm not certain what that is. Does any, if anyone at home uh, knows what that is, please let me know. Because it's very hard to, it's broken. Why is it broken? Beating or Maybe that's, is that the bell? Is that the liberty bell? No, it's not the liberty bell. What were you saying? Beating or plowshares. Potentially, it could be beating plowshares, uh, swords into plowshares. But anyway, I don't know how that would. Yeah, it's odd. But then you have here, you know, wisdom coming down from on heaven. You know, this is a classic hand of God coming to illuminate the world. So that's philosophy. Uh, just a quick, where do you get it? You, you say this one's name, this one's name. What is the source of that? Is um, it a book you're looking at or plans or where, where are the names? Where did you get to the names? I got it from... I can tell you afterwards. Okay. I, I just, yeah. I just, when I, once I found it, I threw it on my. Yeah. Eye. No, I, I, I'm very impressed that you know the name of each. It's one. from one of our printed books. Okay. There's not, not the one that Father Wright made, but we had, there's a couple that were made in the yes. 80s. They're little tiny ones, and they just had the list. Oh, that's and, and uncommented. They don't go into why it's called. They just that. list the names. Okay. Yeah. They just list the names. And these, and these interpretations, thank you, Betsy. Um, or, or mine, and mine alone. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm running with what they said. Um, you move past oak again and the acorn to what looks like letters. This is letters. You see an inkwell, a book, um, glasses that will help you to read, and what looks like a, um, a time glass, um, an hourglass. I don't know what that has to do with letters, but maybe it's just time is short, tempest fugit. So you better, you know, write what you have to say down so that others may be able to enjoy it like you. Um, it's amazing what we get to learn from the dead, you know, to read a novel that someone wrote in the 19th century, even just Don Quixote. I mean, just the amount of inner light we get and inner awareness from another is just extraordinary. Um, you go here and I've shown you the lilies and we're going to have to loop around to, oh, we have time here to show, oh, this is all flipped. This is theology, but let me let me bring us to uh, 
one which, which turns it the right side up. Here we go. Uh, 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 there we go. This is meant to be theology. And I see a, um, a cross being held by a hand covered in a cloth. I see a stole that, um, at the top with a cross on its neck. I see a candelabra being used for worship. And I see um, a book with text that is very hard for me to read. Uh, Teon, Tom, it's something in Greek, um, but I just don't know what it is yet. You know, maybe I can get a really good camera and get a really good shot. You know, the kind of detailed shots just don't exist that I found just yet. Um, so anyway, theology. You move further down and you'll make your way to, this might be patently obvious for the 1960s. Science, exactly. Science. We have the atom. Uh, you know, it's an awful way to draw an atom. I was taught by my science professor, you know, but it is what we used in the 60s to denote it. Um, they don't really orbit like, a, you know, around a sun, like a planet orbits around a sun. They're really in a probability cloud, but who's parsing? Um, there's a um, telescope. Um, there is a microscope, so you can see uh, closely. And what looks like one of the Gemini um, capsules, or one of the capsules that come down from the heavens when we shoot somebody up there. Uh, and then what is also next door is some kind of canister, which uh, could be used for anything. But I, I bet it's for some specialized purpose. I don't know what it's for. That is science, uh, you know, one of the branches of learning. You move down and hear the roses, and then here, which, which we looked at before, here's medicine, all right? Now, the, um, the, the final row, we well, might as well start over here. Um, again, it alternates with the, with the plants and, and symbolizing various things. Here are your grapes and your vines. And this is various vocations. Um, this one is very appropriate for um, the parade that happened yesterday. Labor. labor, exactly, exactly. Here we have labor. We have a tractor. We've got a, a look, it looks like a pickaxe. We've got more gears. We have, ooh, what is that? A, a turning lathe or something? You know, it looks like something, you know, I guess. Um, it does, it does. It's probably something you put wood on and you and you turn it really fast. What is that called? Lathe. It is a lathe. Okay, yeah, I think it's a lathe. So that's labor. And then you work, go past the wheat and then you move over here to, ooh, interesting. Communication. Two phones. What looks like a ticker, a stock ticker of old. You see that? For the glass globe, which would have held, you know, the ticket, the mechanism, um, and what looks like a desk, looks to me like a wooden desk. It's close to finance management. Secretary, it's the secretary. Yeah, it's a secretary, exactly. And um, and there's some kind of thing here. It looks like it could be a sled, but it's not. It must be something else. Um, again, communication. Uh, you know, it's definitely like finance. Um, and management. Let's move down. What's the difference the second and third? The second was professions, and this is what? Um, this is vocations. The first, the middle was branches of learning. So theology, this is a theology. So hence they lent, they lent heavily on books. You would see books in all of them. And they were open and they would say certain things, but it's really hard to read what they say um, with the, these photos. Um, again, I guess only the angels are meant to read them, a good classic Gothic understanding of, of art. Um, you go past the roses and you make your way to, you're going to have to read these sideways. Uh, I see the Red Cross. I see the Salvation Army. And I see other symbols that don't make sense to me yet. Um, these are social services. And it looks like some... Entity, it looks like the seals of two entities that I don't quite know where they are yet. I'm looking forward to finding out what they are. Then we keep moving um, past the other side. Let's see. There. Oh, let's see if this 
can teach us a little bit more. Does anyone recognize that symbol? Must be some symbol from an entity that was flourishing in the 60s. Um, yeah, I don't recognize it either. Let's keep moving past the roses again to another vocation. Isti me docu bas docu bastisti docume ah, occupy. Oh, I don't know what that is, but this is evidently education. It looks like there's an inkwell, um, there's a quill, there's a, a lamp that is lit so that you can study into the night, some um, book with a bookmark so you can keep your ears in place. Um, for to, as you continue your studies. And here we are. Arts. 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 This is the arts. Um, we have horns, clarinets, um, a harp, um, some kind of triangle image in the back. I don't know. It's hard to tell what that's meant to be. But then you have the brushes and the palette and what looks like a bust that was made out of sculpture, yeah, out of uh, some kind of sculpting uh, medium, whether it was stone or something like that. And, and you know, it looks like a bust because it's got a, a laurel in the crown of the bust. So it's some allusion to some, you know, Roman bust or some such. All right, and then, oh, interesting. Yes, art and music, sorry, I've broken up. So there's art and music. So, an amazing array of images just in the archway alone to walk through. And, and, and what it, what's extraordinary to me is that there are more images and layers of meaning in that archway alone, let alone all of the other images that are portrayed and all the other stories and illusions that are happening. And, and you have to pass through it all and you have to kind of experience it all um, somehow. Um, I mean, the effect for me uh, is at first overwhelming, but then once you learn it and once you know, it's almost fortifying because then you can like see, it's like looking at a family tree you know, and you know everybody on the family tree. Uh, here is this array of symbols that tell us who we are and who we're meant to be at our highest level. Um, and you know, it's, uh, it's just an extraordinary uh, way to experience. You know, other traditions will minimize their imagery, but we keep piling on layer upon layer upon layer and having the imagery rhyme and having the imagery build on itself and having it grow and, and be possibly more um, detailed than we could probably, possibly, um, you know, digest in one sitting, you know. You know, it took, look at how long it took me to go through a very basic a close reading of the imagery, and uh, we're still going. I think we have a, a time enough to look at one more thing. Um, I, I want to look at the, uh, this guy. All right. We had talked about him last week, uh, the Thomas statue. Now, th these are a bit better um, images now, do you see in the carvings, you can see the oak leaf. Or, do you see here? The oak leaf is here, and then some kind of five-petaled flower. That doesn't look like a rose to me. But um, anyway, you've got oak and maybe a rose um, going around. So the imagery is integrated that's separate in the other arches. Um, but here is St. Thomas and heavily lidded you know, eyes as if he's opening his eyes, it, definitely not closing them, or maybe he is, maybe he's closing them in prayer. Uh, he's, he's opening his mouth, or is he closing his I think he's opening his eyes and opening his mouth, about to say something. You have his beautiful robes and his hands put out in, in a very interesting, they're outstretched, but they're outstretched on one side in blessing, you see that, that the classic blessing is to put two of your fingers down against your palm and have the other three uh, put out 
like so. Um, you know, some people think, you know, the Orthodox will tell you the two that are at your palm are the human and divine, uh, you know, identities of Christ, you know, touching earth. And then the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in the other three. But that's, you know, that came later, likely. Um, this probably was done because it was for some other reason. But it is a, a classic um, image of blessing. And you go over here, an outstretched hand. What? To take your hand? Uh, to, to offer guidance? To offer direction? Um, to offer, you know, prayers upward to God? You know, so in, in a way, you have uh, the priestly quality of praying to God uh, on the people's behalf and blessing the people on God's behalf. Uh, his apostolic ministry right, is, is, is found in his hands. Um, it is said in the documents that I received, um, I think this is also, here we can look at his feet, since you might, you might as well check out his feet. There we go. Nothing special, but it's interesting to look at close up. Um, it said that this is the point it was written in the book that I read, um, that we published, that this is the moment that he stands up from the moment where he kneels before Christ in the upper room, saying, my Lord and my God. What moment is that? That moment is portrayed here in the very, you know, center of our rarities. Um, St. Thomas, in this case, is lifting up, look at where his hand is next to Christ. See that? Uh, look how lively that hand is. It's not just a simple hand. It's very articulate. And he's looking up at Christ and, and holding out his hand to us, the people. Um, it, it's one of the most extended parts of the Raridos. You know, as a priest, when I'm sitting up in the sedilia, most nothing sticks out more than Thomas's hand. You know, in, in this, in the, through the fourth wall. It's like it's coming out through the fourth wall to you. All right. And that same kind of impulse is found here with hands coming out to us in blessing and in prayer. Um, I like to think in this, uh, in this image here, um, here, let's look at the image of Christ. Uh, you know, this is really impressive um, coming down. I'd like to think that St. Thomas as our patron saint, is gesturing up to Christ and out to us, all right? As if to say, look, look at what I've seen, the, my Lord and my gods. He's connecting with his Lord along with him, and he's connecting with us. Um, Jesus's hands, you see that? Do you see the wounds? What is compelling to me is that our impulse was to, and this is a picture from the 1936, I'm told. Um, John Cupchalk gave this to me, and he wants to know when they made the shift. But the image that is now in our ambulatory used to be in the, you know, the very location where we now have St. Thomas. All right. And, and here, you know, Christ is doing the same thing with his hands that we ultimately would have St. Thomas doing with his, at least for one of them. Right, look, a hand of blessing, like I was saying, three fingers up, two fingers down, and then you have here uh, St. Thomas with his like that, but not, but much more muted. It's almost like the, the hands, you would never bless like how he's holding his hands. It's almost like he's putting them in place like that to lift them up in blessing to us. It's almost like he's just got the idea in his head to, to put his hands out and bless us. Just like, I think, he's just got his, an idea in his head to open his eyes after a very long time of having them closed. And just like it looks like he has, is just opening his mouth as if to say a good word, whatever that word might be. It might be my Lord and my God. Um, I don't know what it would be, but it, it specifically alludes to um, the moment that this is the statue of the moment right after this, all right, right after this moment. So these two statues, which really are at the center of our, of our architecture, are sequential in sacred history. 
very, very close in moments. You know, it's like a, a creating a living picture, um, a snapshot of two very, very close and pivotal moments for our patron saint. The moment where he kneels before Christ and the moment when he stands up and begins to act as someone who sees the risen Christ uh, when the other does when he hadn't before, you know, he, he wouldn't believe. This is St. Thomas convinced, right? And, but it's almost like St. Thomas waking up and St. Thomas ready to bless the world. Um, it's just really, there's a, you know, if you start to, you know, explore, um, there's a lot going on there. And especially when you think about it in relationship to the other works. Now, um, next week, I, I'm going to stop sharing here. All right. So it's 1045. And I'd like to end here. Um, I'd like to not take questions because I've got to get ready for the patrol feast services that we're doing. Um, I'm just, if you have any questions, please email me and I'd be happy to address them next week. Um, I saw, oh, I see there's texting that you've been doing this whole time. Uh, are there any triangle represents architecture? Excellent. Uh, when were these relief sculptures made and installed? They were made in the 60s. 1962 was when they were carved. They were installed in 1963. Um, has to be learning. Uh, oh, the rose you showed looked like the Tudor rose of Henry VIII. Certainly. You'll find the red and uh, white roses uh, all over the place to allude to British English uh, history. But they, at the very root, they were alluding to sacred history. You know, they were alluding to Christ in their imagery. So uh, they came first. Um, anyway, I must dash, but it's been an honor to share all this with you. And thank you for the occasion to learn it and ingest and, and it and then be able to digest it and, and uh, you know, proclaim it in a way uh, that it's now become a part of me. I hope it's become a part of you. All the very best. Bye. Thank you.